Okay, good evening and welcome. This is the November 6th regularly scheduled meeting of the Islam Meadow School Committee. I will call the meeting to order 602. This meeting is being both audio and videotaped this evening. I would ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Okay, hey, roll call, Sam, please. Samantha Velasquez, Secretary. Pamela Blair, Assistant Superintendent for Business. Anson Alamichel. Gordon Smith, Superintendent of Schools. Gregory Thompson. Sarah Trulio. Kate Leiden. Brown, Director of Curriculum. Adrian Neal. Okay, great. We have some minutes for approvals, please. I move to approve the October 16th, 2023 regular session meeting minutes. Motion made by Sarah. Okay. Second my Tanella discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Here's five to zero. And move to the October 23rd, 2023 professional development meeting minutes. Which are made by Antonella. Second. Second by Kate discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. That carries five to zero. Thank you, Samantha. Mm -hmm. Committee and subcommittee communications. Amy, would you like to start us out? Sure. This past week, I attended an eLeaf meeting. They are. We discussed some of their upcoming events, some changes in leadership, and I'll probably have some more to report um, next time when they go into more detail about some of the upcoming fundraising events. Great. It's not. I don't have anything. Good, Kate. Okay. Nothing yet. My meetings are this Wednesday, actually. Awesome. Good luck. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, nothing this time. Audrey? Um, so just to give the updates on the school, um, we have the NHS induction ceremony coming up on Wednesday, uh, the 15th, which I think is kind of important, and I think it's good to honor the students for working so hard. Um, we've done well in the school with the field hockey winning Western Mass., um, there was recently actually a model UN field trip just this weekend. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And all the delegates did really well. And even our own student fund me, um, actually ended up winning best delegate and it was our first time there. So we represented the school really well. And it's not a UConn. Yeah, it was, it was cool. beautiful. And then speaking of representing the school well, the ALC committee, the Athletic Leadership Council, um, has gone to a leadership seminar and we're going to a sportsmanship one that I'm going to be attending to um, this Thursday. And just I feel all these are important because they're all kind of fostering the school environment and we're all representing ourselves well. So I thought it was hey, important to share. Thank you, Andres. Excellent. Thank you so much. Want to do students of the month? Sure, please. Okay. Uh, these are our students of the month for October for the uh, Career Tech at Lower Pioneer Valley, bless you, um, Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative. So we had Emmanuel Reyes, who is in the Building Property Maintenance uh, Program. Actually, he's at the Building Property Maintenance 2. Uh, there's a Building Property Maintenance 1 and a Building Property Maintenance 2. We also had Thomas Boisine for Graphic and Visual Design 1. We had um, Gavin Dubelow who is in the Information Support Services and Networking Program. And we had Nicholas Seal, who is also in the Information Support Services and Networking. So congratulations to all of them. They are the Students of the Month for Career Tech, ALPVC. They're our students, but they're in their programs. They are Students of the Month. Great. Very good news. Thank you so much. Okay, we have an opportunity for visitors to address the committee. Seeing none, we will move right along. Approval of, of the MIAA waiver for ice hockey and wrestling. We have Mr. McGee here, athletic director for ELHS. And Mr. Page, principal of ELHS. So we're getting ready for winter sports. Uh, they'll start the Monday after Thanksgiving. And there's two sports in the winter that we're looking to include eighth graders on. Uh, the first one is ice hockey. The ice hockey waiver would be for JV only. So the eighth graders would not be playing in varsity ice hockey games. They'd only be playing in JV ice hockey games. Our head coach has assured me that he's going to uh, do a special schedule for our JV team to make sure that we're matching up against teams that are 
have eighth graders, ninth graders, and some 10th graders. Uh, so it'd be a, a special JV schedule for them for competitive balance. Um, and that would allow the eighth graders to play JV ice hockey if it was approved by the school committee. The other eighth grade waiver that we're looking for approval on is for wrestling. Uh, so wrestling is also a unique sport where the coaches talk before each match and they always match up the wrestlers based on their uh, skill, ability, and background as far as, um, you know, their grades. Um, we would be looking to fill some weight classes with those eighth graders, but our wrestling coaches have had eighth grade waivers before, uh, and they always put our wrestlers in a, in a position to succeed and not in a situation where they would be overmatched. Um, you know, you, you would not see an eighth grader that's inexperienced in wrestling, wrestling against an experienced high school wrestler. So it's always communicated by the coaches. So those are the two waivers. They've been approved um, at the local level by the uh, local athletic directors. It's also been approved by the MIA. And the last step is uh, asking for school committee approval for those eighth grade waivers. Mr. Page supports it. We have coaches for the JV team? Yes. Yeah, so uh, for JV ice hockey, we would uh, be employing a head varsity coach and then uh, typically, we employ a supporting varsity coach and also a JV coach. Uh, and Coach Reed uses the other two coaches. Um, they're really interchangeable. Sometimes Coach Reed coaches a JV game. Sometimes he has the other two coaches coach the JV games. And he would he's very involved with the scheduling with ice hockey. Uh, and with wrestling. A separate practice time? I'm just thinking of like ice. Yeah, so they would actually uh, all practice at the same time. So it would they would all be on the ice together. Um, the only added ice time would be when we fill in those JV ice hockey games, um, but they would, it would be a joint practice. Any other questions or discussion? Motion then, please. Audrey, what do you think? I think it's a cool opportunity. <laughs> Keep the teams going, right? Yeah. Okay, make a motion then, please. I move to approve the MIAA waiver for ice hockey and wrestling as presented. Motion made by Kate. Second. Second by Antonella. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That carries five to zero. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So tonight we have, as you can see, our entire leadership team here. Um, we, as you know, over the last uh, three meetings, really, we've been talking about um, not only the draft of our SMART goals, but the um, fall data. Um, and you've seen the district SMART goals and then off of our professional development. You have our district SMART goals back in your packet once again as we tweak them a little bit based on the professional development, adding in some percentages and some numbers um, around some of the specific action steps. Um, that also has set up our presentations that you'll hear tonight where each school has the opportunity to take the three overarching district goals and really hone in on under each goal, one objective and one action step that, at least the way I'm describing it, um, tells that school's story. Um, obviously, they're doing more than just that one action step, but um, that's in the interest of time. One of the things we had discussed was sometimes these presentations, uh, notably because I happen to be a talker, can go on quite long. Um, and so we have tried to keep it succinct. <laughs> but um, one of the things that we are all focusing on, and you'll hear it in every presentation, is attendance. Um, we did get to see... Our attendance, um, or at least our chronic absenteeism, our attendance got better. Our chronic absenteeism fell. We'd like to see that happen again and um, continue to exceed targets uh, that are set for us by DESE. So at the district level, we're looking at uh, our chronic absenteeism falling again by at least 3%. Uh, and each school is um, looking that as well. And you'll hear some of that tonight. Um, at the district level, our, our Administrator for Health Services, Andy Goyette, who's in the back, um, and a new part-time outreach coordinator, which is coming through our 
comprehensive health grant, uh, we're going to be working to support the schools, but also be generating more of a district wide message to continue the idea that really to do your best learning, you have to be here. Do your best teaching, you have to be here. Um, and so we all want to be here together and make that happen. So that's something you're going to hear as a theme going throughout. Um, in terms of teaching and learning, we know that we continue to be at a point where we're not surpassing what was pre-COVID. Um, that was something we had dis discussed quite a bit in our professional development. Uh, and so we'd like to see us continue to break out of that and start to achieve where we were and even more so um, before COVID uh, and really get back to seeing our students excel. Our students are excelling, but we'd like to see all of our students excel. And so we're digging into the data um, and you'll see under teaching and learning that we feel if we can hit successfully all these action steps, um, that we'll, we're going to see 75% of our students across the grade levels, whether it be on iReady or whether it be on the traditional MCAS, hit their um, traditional growth and or average growth on MCAS. And then we'd really like to see, and we I think we need to really focus in on at least 30% of our students stretch growth. If they can hit that stretch growth, we've seen those graphs that predict future success, um, then by year's end, we'll be in a position where we're starting to see some of the achievement levels that we used to see pre-COVID. Those are some of the biggest changes on the um, in terms of the district boards. Uh, and what you'll hear tonight, uh, each school, as I said, we're going to tell their story. And I think we've queued up the high school. And so we have Mr. Page, Ms. Blaine, and Mr. Wright ready to go. I'll stop talking because we were talking about being succinct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just one quick question. Uh, obviously, the format's a little bit different. Do you want to pause and slide us go right through the end and answer questions? You can keep going. I'll stop you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, just to start off by uh, talking about the attendance goal at the high school, um, I guess it's better as an action step. Uh, so connected to the uh, supporting the whole child goal, where all ELHS staff will create a safe, joyful, nurturing, and equitable, inclusive learning environment in which students will feel valued, connected, and ready to learn. Uh, the action step we are taking, which is consistent with the district goal, is working with the LHS families to ensure consistent school attendance. Uh, this work will be supported by the ELHS attendance team. Um, this is something that we established this past summer. Uh, it's a uh, it's a group of educators. That's a combination of administrators, counselors, teachers. Uh, we also asked uh, Ms. Goyette and Ms. Martin to join us as well, and they've been attending our meetings um, to uh, strategize different ways to uh, tackle chronic absenteeism. Um, for us, uh, at the high school, while we exceeded our state identified target for a chronic absenteeism rate for all students in 22-23 uh, put forth by the state, we did fall short of our state identified target for high need students, especially students in our low income population, even though we did improve um, uh, from the previous year. Uh, so we have seen this uh, not just through the data, but also just uh, anecdotally in the work that we do that um, we do have those higher rates of uh, absenteeism, chronic absenteeism um, with students in our high needs population. And specifically, as you, as you can see, um, students in our low income population. So uh, obviously we are aware there's a direct correlation between attendance and student achievement. Um, so we are trying to be strategic in uh, working on this this year um, with our attendance team uh, to you know target some of those students where we might um, you know, have concerns about, uh, you know, about their attendance already, even in November, uh, working with families, uh, identifying different strategies uh, through the attendance team. And uh, what we do find is a lot of those uh, strategies are unique to that situation based on the profile of that student, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, identifying a point person in the building, um, providing them different um, counseling supports, whatever it might be. Uh, to uh, improve their attendance back at the school. So um, hope is by the end of this year, we do reduce that chronic absenteeism and, and meet our state target for our high needs population. And one of the things just to piggyback off what Mr. Page was saying is that um, we're really trying to partner. We're not looking to punish. We're looking to partner 
so that we can solve the issues that might be impeding someone from coming to school as opposed to uh, sort of the traditional <clears throat> thinking has been, you know, you have uh, your party or you're this, uh, we're going to add um, detention and so forth. We're looking to problem solve uh, and so partner more than we are punish. The important piece for us is a lot of times in the past when this work is being done, it was top down and we are trying to take a more collaborative approach with our staff this year where it's that, uh, you know, takes a village to raise a child approach. Um, so the hope is we can uh, create that environment where that kid does want to come to school. So when we have those conversations, it's not necessarily just around, you know, why you're failing this class and, and why you're struggling here, but it's the relationships that they have to get them back in the building. Frank, I'm struggling. I'm sorry. The, the rate percentage, that's um, chronic, absenteeism chronic absenteeism on a yearly basis. 21% of our students are chronically absent throughout the year. We're chronically absent in the year 22. Uh, and then in 23, it dropped 17.9. Hmm. That's about 10%. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how do we define chronic? 10%. 10%. 10%. Of above the 10%. Year. Yeah. Or more. And that actually, the states found that that's uh, at the high school level, it's hovering around 30%, I believe, uh, across the Commonwealth. Yeah. Uh, high, school, high schools are the ones struggling the most with the um, chronic absenteeism and the attendance situation. But all grade levels, since we've come back from COVID, are struggling with much higher rates of chronic absenteeism across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. That is a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the commissioner um, two weeks ago uh, had a call to action. He recommended to the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to have a call to action around attendance uh, and support districts in doing the work that we actually started to do back in August. So for the outcome, is that then to reduce the chronic absenteeism in alignment with the state targets? Uh, I would like to see exceeded state targets across the board in all demographics. This approach is not being punitive. Mm -hmm. so, thank you for speaking on that. Uh, so the next part of supporting the whole uh, child, Anne's going to walk us through, and this is some of the work that we've done with our freshmen this year um, in um, putting in, into play something that we've been talking about for the last couple of years, and uh, that's the establishment of our freshman team of teachers. So this is also in relation to supporting the whole child and utilizing a multi-tiered system of supports to ensure all students progress both academically and in their social, emotional, and behavior behavioral development. And so I'm excited to be part of this as the ninth and 10th grade assistant principal. Um, we have, we're creating structures to support freshmen uh, in their transition to high school. And so for some kids, it seems seamless. And for other students, it's definitely a struggle. Um, it includes, but it's not limited to the establishment of a team of teachers. And so this team of teachers is made up of core academic teachers, special educators, the counselor, myself, and also the BCBA. Um, so, you know, what was behind this? A few years of discussion. And last year we had some students who needed to take credit recovery courses during the year and also uh, during the summer. Uh, so we felt that having something in place to support students right from the beginning of high school was going to give them what they needed so that even if they came in at risk, we can put some things in support and hopefully uh, they wouldn't leave still being at risk. They would get what they needed. Um, so we're identifying strategies um, that will help students. We can intervene for those who are struggling, build those foundational skills um, so that they can be successful over the four years. And so some students had a complete credit recovery and they graduated on time. I think we only had one who did not. Um, but we obviously want to avoid this crunch as they get closer to graduation. Um, so what we did is we took students who were um, going to be taking standard algebra as a cohort group. And um, so we looked at 
at them as being the kids that are quote unquote on the team. And so um, the core academic teachers get together during a certain block. They have this roster of students in common and um, we get together and we talk about a variety of different things that are going on in classes and with the students on the team. And we can actually utilize their foundation block as almost like an intervention block for them. And that's where some of this work is being done. Um, obviously, the hope is that by building a foundation for students as freshmen, we're going to be um, decreasing the number of students who are struggling and at risk uh, of not graduating on time. And uh, they won't have to play catch up in their junior and senior years. Uh, so back to me. Um, I was just going to ask, how how are you monitoring the progress of that cohort? Is it looking at their report card grades in their ninth grade year? Is it looking at attendance? I'm just curious, like, how, how are monitoring that to measure success in terms of potential impact as juniors and seniors? So this is the first year that we've done it. So some of that... Um, data is going to be forthcoming in future years as we see, the, see those kids move through the ranks and we'll be able to, you know, draw some comparisons in hindsight, looking back to see sure. if some of the structure we're putting into place work. Uh, in the time being, um, right now we do have those teachers meeting three days a week. Uh, I'm sorry, three days in a four day rotation, uh, and does chair those meetings. Um, they go through things like attendance, grades, uh, potential referrals based on some of that information, whether it's for different sports, um, it could be through the attendance team, whatever it might be. Uh, so there is that real time, we'll call it formative data, uh, the, the hard data of looking at things like we talked about where we, where we have those at risk juniors and seniors were a couple of years away of, um, so your ninth grade also will have the iReady data this year. We do have we do have that piece where um, right now we do have a targeted group of um, of freshmen uh, who they obviously they, all, they completed the first iReady diagnostic in October. Um, we have the numbers um, where we have that group who will say was performing below grade level in math and English based on their iReady diagnostic and uh, correct me if I'm wrong in saying this, but I believe every student who test below grade level actually was already a member of that team um, of teachers. So we did, we'll say correctly identify them coming in. Um, and uh, <laughs> our, um, intervention strategies using the academic program uh, to um, remediate some of those math and English skills um, during their foundations block one day out of a four day rotation. Uh, that'll be starting the week before Thanksgiving break. Um, and the hope is by the time they take the second iReady diagnostic in January, some of those students who um, demonstrated some of those efficiencies have moved out of that group. Okay. Uh, so teaching and learning. Um, so this does talk a little bit about the um, the iReady diagnostic we were just walking through. Um, this is the first year that we've we've had a, a diagnostic tool uh, at the high school, similar to what you've seen at the uh, the three to eight levels, where they've been using the iReady uh, diagnostic for for a while. Um, now, uh, as far as the the action step that we're looking at, we're focusing on two point three: the use of the MTSS process to implement academic supports interventions that pr um, provide all students, particularly students with disabilities and ELL learners, equitable academic with deep, deep learning. And uh, digging in there, um, we are giving universal academic screeners, analyzing those results collaboratively three times a year. The high school will implement an iReady testing system for the freshmen and continue to review SAT data. Um, so right now, our focus has been on the iReady um, data that we just got back from our kids and identifying uh, the structure of how we're going to be putting some of that intervention, those interventions in place for the freshmen. We don't have the PSAT yet for the 2023 year, um, uh, but when that does become available, we'll we'll be looking at that as well to see if um, uh, there's anything that we can utilize there. A lot of times when we use the PSAT data, um, using it a lot in comparison to some of the stuff that we see in our MCAS data from our sophomores. Obviously, there's typically that same group in the previous year took the MCAS test. Um, 
So we're looking one at the student level um, at some of that information to see if there's consistency and also just, just school-wide consistency and trends. Uh, I will say the MCAS data does go a little bit deeper for us in terms of um, giving us some information about the standards and um, SAT data, I think, is a good data point, but it's a little broader in some in ge uh, general breakdowns of um, the different categories. Like in English, they break it down by just like four general or broad categories. In math, they break it down like it's like algebra, you know, so it's not breaking down by all of the specific standards. Um, but we do try to see if there's any um, the discrepancies between what we were looking at in our previous year's MCAS, what we see on the SAT data. Um, uh, and just speaking of the MCAS, uh, obviously, uh, that is an area where we need to um, continue to improve. We did see that that pandemic dip. Uh, we bounced back a little bit in 2022, um, but... Uh, there are definitely areas where we would like to see some improvements, specifically with our students with disabilities and our high needs population in math and English. Um, and uh, we are working to um, take targeted approaches in those two departments to to address both those things. Kind of jumped around a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess my question would be how how are teachers responding to potentially having. So when you're talking about ninth grade, there's in particular in math, um, having to go back to potentially eighth grade or seventh grade skills mm -hmm. in order to shore those gaps up. So how are educators feeling in terms of having to navigate standards that are not the standards they're used to having to address in like a traditional algebra one? Are you talking about it with the iReady data? With the iReady data and then just knowing that there's probably some gaps there based on the decline from last year and then what's potentially coming in this year for a ninth grade class. Yeah, so uh, fortunately, like I said, the the students who were seeing a lot of those gaps with our students who are members of that team, uh, we did ensure that all those students on the team had a <laughs> foundation block. Mm -hmm. um, that is a block where we're, uh, we're going to be running our intervention time. Um, the algebra teacher is going to be overseeing uh, the interventions for those students. So what's great for me is, well, she's going through a curriculum on a day-to-day -day basis in her algebra classes. She has the same students in that intervention time to try to remediate those skills that's not taking away from the class time as well. So it's almost core plus moment is really what we're working on. All right. Some allergy shots today may have tearing me up. <laughs> um, so we're we want to focus on developing partnerships with students, and really we're highlighting the student voice here this year for um, this particular you know goal. Um, I'm glad that we referenced the athletic leadership council because that's a part of what we're trying to do, which is put kids in spaces where they can talk with us about how to make the school better. Um, so we want to continue to create an inclusive environment at the school and just use as many platforms as we can to elevate student voice. We want to make sure that there's genuine opportunities to serve in leadership and decision making. Um, it's a great sign that nine out of 10 kids almost or nine out of 10 feel that it's an inclusive school. Um, unfortunately, 20 percent don't feel like they're a part of any of those particular communities. And so when you look at the rest of the data, we have a 20% chronic absence rate, right? I mean, they're not the same exact kids, but it's the same. And so the more that we can get this point across that kids feel like they're a part of a community within our school, then the higher likelihood is we can impact these other areas. So um, essentially, diversity and equity and inclusion committee, um, the athletic leadership council through our, our school council, where we've asked the parents to kind of take a step back and let the, let the students speak more there. Um, we're hoping to get above 90% on both of these areas. And so I don't think a 2% growth is much, but if we're able to get that top number to 90%, then I think we'll make an impact on the rest of the things that we talked about tonight too. I think what's great there too, if we can uh, give some kudos to Audrey over here, a number of these committees that we're referencing, she's already a member of, she's a member of, uh, of your school committee. Uh, the more we can incorporate student voice into any of these different groups, uh, um, the more included they're going to feel and, and the more they're going to feel like they're heard, you know? So, and she also didn't mention she's the president of NHS. For next week. Oh, that's, the kind of that's, that's right. Thank you for that. <laughs> Great kid. She's a pianist. 
than that earlier. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you, high school. Appreciate it. Which uh, presentations on are interim principal and interim assistant principal. I didn't, I know you've met Mr. Pearson. I don't know if you've met uh, Ms. Andrew yet. Uh, so it's their first uh, big public meeting. So welcome. Welcome. Yeah. And they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, it's very busy fall. Yeah. A lot of staff changes. Mm. Middle school is never boring. That is for sure. <laughs> Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to speak first um, to our, we have two supporting the whole child goals. The first one around attendance, as Gordon said, it's a statewide uh, imperative that we improve the attendance. So of course we put some thought into that. Looking at how we support students physical and safe spaces by, we have uh, created a mini attendance team spearheaded by our student intervention coordinator, but also involving our nurse and individual champions from our MTSS team. Um, we're kind of tackling this problem by trying to get ahead of it early. Um, in the past, we've sent out letters after each quarter to students that have missed five or more days to try and uh, alert them to the fact they were on track to be deemed chronically absent, set up meetings with administration to see what we could do. So we're trying to get ahead of that. So our student intervention coordinator is meeting weekly with the nurse and some of our NTSS people to look at kids who have missed four days, whether they're consecutive or not, because that puts them on track and to get that narrative started early. We're tracking a spreadsheet, kind of who's been absent, why they're absent, what contact we've made with the family, what supports we've offered. Uh, we had a banner year last year, according to our MCAS accountability, as far as reducing um, chronic absenteeism, we got four out of four points, exceeding our targets everywhere except with our African-American population, but a pretty good year. So we still want to improve on that anyway. So, so far, reaching out to these families, we've done a pretty good job of forming those partnerships, making them aware of some of the resources. I think it's something that's going to continue to grow, especially as we have the holiday season and people tend to miss more time. Uh, but a thing to note is that last year after quarter one, we sent out 105 letters to families that had missed five or more days at that point. As of Thursday of last week, we're on track to send out 34. So that's a heck of a reduction so far, just to what we're doing. And we even got to the fun part, which is the incentives. We would like to recognize and incentivize students that have really good attendance. So we're planning on, along with our honorable breakfast, recognizing students that are coming to school all the time. We're planning on having some perfect attendance lotteries for students to earn some prizes. We've been talking to our student council and to our PTO about sponsoring for smaller time frames, um, perfect attendance, no tardies, get a free ticket to the dance, things to really get people excited about being coming to school because it is important. You can't learn if you're not in school. So we've been training in the right direction and we want to see that continue for the 2023-2024 school year. Okay. So Jung Andrew is going to talk about our second supporting the whole child goal. Hey, thank you. Good evening. Our second objective is to utilize multi-tiered system of supports to ensure that all students uh, progress both academically and in their social, emotional, and behavioral development. One of the main things we wanted to do is really figure out how to strengthen our tier one instruction and really re-engage our students. Um, and we noticed that on our data, while we are showing some growth and um, we're showing progress with our student growth, uh, we're meeting typical growth on the higher end, but our achievement data is not growing as fast as we would, we would like to see it. And so we realized that in order to increase the achievement, we need to re-engage our students a little differently. And so we have the benefit of having some academic instructional coaches in our building. We have an, a literacy coach as well as a math coach. And we decided to re-examine how we use those, those instructors um, to really push back into the classroom with our teachers. A lot of times teachers don't reach out and ask for support. They just kind of do what they've been doing. Um, but we realized that we really want to help teachers figure out how to re-engage our students. And so we're use, using our coaches to push back in with our, with our teachers. And we have created what we call coaching cycles. And they are two-week coaching cycles. Um, the way that these roll out um, is that the teacher will sit down with the coach. We're starting with our ELA and our math departments. And they will come up with a plan um, 
basically the teacher will just be open and transparent. This is non-judgmental. Um, there's no supervisory role in this at all. It's just a support piece. Um, how can the teacher um, re-engage students? So there might be some examination of lessons and figure out, hmm, maybe we can plan a lesson together that can add some additional strategies. Maybe the coach can model some lessons for the teacher to observe. And then the teacher can kind of take something back from that. Maybe, um, the teacher, the coach um, and teacher can, you know, do a co-planning of a lesson, writing things out from the beginning to the end, all the way through the assessments, maybe pulling some small groups together and then um, giving the, you know, the, the teacher watching the coach do that, or just the coach um, observing the teacher and giving the teacher some real-time feedback that focus on specific goals that that particular teacher has. So we just started that. We have finished our first two week cycle and our teachers, surprisingly, were very interested in that. And um, it's, it's looking very promising. Um, of course, the holiday season is coming up. So we're kind of taking a step back to and, you know, looking at that process, um, reflecting on the data. Basically, there'll be like a pre meeting with each teacher and coach. Then within the two week cycle, the coach will visit that, that teacher's class at least three times, mm -hmm. um, you know, with specific instructions, and then they'll have some type of reflection at the end. And so right now we are, you know, looking through our first cycle, examining the reflection, looking at any data that's come out of that, um, just getting a teacher's feel for, you know, how that felt. And then when the holiday season um, comes to an end, we'll re-engage the next set of teachers on a two-week cycle. And ultimately, once we run through the English and the math departments, our goal is to do the same thing with the science and social studies departments. The, ultimately, the goal is to support teachers to, you know, figure out any kind of discrepancies or any kind of barriers to engagement that might be happening in the classroom and fill those gaps in with some new strategies, some new ideas, thinking outside of the box collaboratively. And therefore, we will hopefully increase our achievement data um, at the, on the next go round in terms of our panorama and also any other in our MCAS results. All right. So. Next, we have our teaching and learning goal. Apologize. Yeah, sure. What is the initial, you know, in terms of, I know you've only done one cycle, but how did the teachers feel? You said it was, it landed pretty well with them. What was some of the initial? Feedback? I'm sure there was a little apprehension, just you know, like, whoa, I'm, I don't need that necessarily. But they really didn't vocalize that, at least, you know, in my presence or in Steve's presence or even with the coaches. Um, again, I think the biggest piece with this is is the way we roll it out and make it so that this is all about you. This is here to support you. Yes. There's no judgment. Not There's evaluative. No, not evaluative. Low, risk, the low risk. risk. Whatever you need, I'll help you. If you want more resources, I'll find them for you. You want me to model something, I'll do it for you. You want me to give you direct feedback on something that you're doing in a class. Absolutely. You want me to work with a small group that you're struggling with and you you need some strategies to re-engage that particular small group. I'll do it for you. So it's really like, well, why would you say no to something like that? So, um, so far, so good. We've had great results in terms of our teacher feedback. Yeah. So we're hoping that, hoping that kind of translates among, among the rest of the staff and eventually into our other departments. Yeah, our ELA and math teachers are used to working with the instructional coaches already, so it's a little bit more low stakes for them. So when we get through the, the whole roster there, we can come back together as a group, see what we might need to tweak for the process, and then we'll try and roll it out to other disciplines as well. Can you be able to work to gather feedback from the coaches around maybe trends that you're seeing so that then that information can be given even to Heather. So when we think about district professional development days, there's ways that we can contract with some of the professional development providers to ensure that it's not just supporting the LA and English teachers potentially at the middle school, but maybe it's a trend that's a little bit broader. Um, yeah, so certainly. We, yeah, we each have an instructional leadership team meeting each week and we do check in about how the coaching cycles are going. Not like a reporting thing. Teachers know that. Just how's it going? What support do you need? And Heather drops in on some of ours. So it could be a great time to share some of the least anecdotal data yeah. that we've been seeing so far. And just a side note, I think even our coaches are are thinking of ways that they can create mm -hmm instruction for maybe the district at some of these PD days based on some of the things that they're experiencing in our building. Correct me if I'm wrong, we have two new coaches this year, correct? Oh, uh, no. Uh, well, one new coach, one was new last year. Okay. One was new last year. Yep. Yep. 
Is there time in the schedule where they're they're meeting with the coaches or is it just the coaches going into their classroom? No, fortunately, we have a lot of collaborative time at the wow. middle school level. So we do have a weekly, uh, we call counterpart meeting, which is good where seventh grade English teachers will meet, seventh grade math teachers will meet. Um, and and we also, place. yeah, we, or they'll do, they do it on their preps yeah. as well. Right. They'll ask sure. to, the coach to come on the prep if that better meets their schedule. Mm-hmm. So collaboration, thankfully, is a, a big thing that we have going on in those And the coach is able to uh, to uh, meet with those teachers as well. So if they're they do see trends, they're able to maybe give them some feedback. Yeah, so some teachers aren't sure exactly what their problem of practice is going to be. So the coach kind of comes with some ideas, mm-hmm. and they might identify a trend and see in other classrooms. Well, are you struggling with this? Because we were able to work through it here and offer those suggestions to people. And our coaches are really good with collecting data and putting it all together and um, analyzing data. So we were really fortunate with that. Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, Next up, we have our teaching and learning goal. I'm going to apologize because I get revoked around this one, which I'm a little passionate about. Um, Specifically about using our MPSS process to implement academic supports and interventions to provide all students, particularly students with disabilities and English learners, equitable access to deeper learning. Um, So this is all about continuing to tailor and grow our tiered interventions. Um, If you look at our data, kind of a, a theme you'll see, that's the data for our lowest performing students. Again, we're seeing typical growth in the high range. But the overall achievement data, while we are seeing growth, we're kind of in the designated, we're improving below the target. So the only way to get the kind of gains that we want to see is going to be to establish some trends where we're getting more of that stretch growth so we can push those numbers where we want to be to really close those gaps. Um, Our tiered programs are mostly targeting our lowest performing students. So evolving those and growing those is going to be key in that endeavor. So we've been trying to widen the net to catch more kids that need those supports than what we've had previously and make sure that the supports that we're offering them like what they need. So historically, we've always had just one tiered option for math and reading at all three grade levels. Um, wasn't so we'd have kids anywhere from one to four grade levels below their peers getting a single intervention. Well, why it was good that they were getting an intervention, it wasn't necessarily serving their needs as best as it could. So a few years ago, we added a tier three for reading to kind of target kids that weren't were having uh, they were significantly below grade level, having trouble with their foundational skills around phonics, phonological awareness. We put in that into place and we saw some gains. It was great. Uh, it was also better able to let our tier two people differentiate in a way that met the needs of those students that had needs more around comprehension and vocabulary than around phonics and recognizing um, high frequency words. So that worked fairly well. And last year we added another layer, an additional tier two intervention. We have our enrichment block, which is kind of a what I need block. Mm -hmm. So we were able to offer interventions by the um, English and math teachers during that time where we can get kids that slightly below grade level, weren't quite enough to qualify for the seats in our tiered program, but needed that little extra bit of support. So now they're getting that during that intervention block during the enrichment time. So that was fantastic. We wanted to extend that to math as well. So this year we added a tier three math program, uh, AVMR, Advantage Math Recovery System, to try and target our kids who have more foundational needs in math around number sense and things like that. We think that by putting these into place, we're going to see bigger gains among our, our neediest students. We're better able to differentiate to meet their needs. They're not stuck with kids with a four grade level span of needs. We can target exactly what they need and uh, hopefully get them to where they need to be. So now we have a wider net and it's more specifically aimed at what the students' needs are showing according to our data. We'll continue to track those needs by our ready diagnostics, um, observations by the teacher, classroom performance. We rotate those rosters as need be quarterly to try and hit as many kids as we can. As they show growth, hopefully we graduate them out of those programs and get kids in there that need them. So that's one I'm really passionate about. It's going to something I'm sure is going to continue to evolve. This is our first year with the tier three math. So we'll look at how it goes and see if we need to make more tweaks to that to better serve the needs of the kids in front of us. Tier three intervention groups are much smaller than the tier. Yes, yes, they are. Well, I mean, not much smaller. I mean, necessarily, um, because now we have the the additional tier two level um, during the enrichment block, which are also small groups. But yeah, they're all small groups. Excellent. Six students. Yeah. And who? Great tier three. Yeah, we have six students. Providing the training for AVMR. Well, we have our math coach is running that training. Right now. She's already been trained in it. So she is running that this year. And of course, we'd like to expand it. We'll have to look at how we can do that with our current staff. Um, 
uh, we've had one quarter in, so we, we're using this as a learning thing to see how it how it's working. Is it meeting our needs? And then we'll see what adjustments we need to make. Thanks. Okay, our final goal is around our inclusive um, supportive culture and climate, and we are looking at indicator 3.1, creating the conditions to sustain and retain highly qualified diverse staff who effectively instruct all students. So we have entered into a uh, professional development relationship with a group called the Academic Leadership Association, the ALA, and this mostly is driven by the data on our end of year panorama survey um, around engagement and supportive relationships from students. Engagement was a big theme for us last year. It's our lowest number when we take that panorama survey. I think it was around 52 at the beginning of last year. We got it up to 56 by the end of the year. And this year's fall survey says we're up to 62. So we're trending in the right direction. And we think that our work with the ALA is going to propel that even further. Um, so we were in a limited partnership with them last year to be mentors to some of our most at-risk students. So they would come in, they would meet with the kids individually, groups, they would run some field trips for them, some study halls, they would meet with the grade level teams to talk about the kids, what problems they were having to help them problem solve around it. So we were really thrilled with the results we saw in that small sample group. We saw a reduction in the numbers of absenteeism and in discipline referrals, and we saw their academic outcomes increase. So of course, we want to try and replicate that success on a wider level. So we've kind of entered into a professional development relationship with the ALA this year. So they're going to continue to do their mentoring for our small groups. And we're already looking at ways we can expand that to get more students to benefit from it. They're also going to meet with our staff. They're going to do an eight-part professional development series on deepening relationships with students, using those to form learning alliances, and then leverage that into increased student outcomes, particularly in engagement, which we think is going to impact everything from attendance to academics, to behavior of students yep. feeling more engaged in the classroom. We're going to see a, a big improvement in all those areas. So we're thrilled at what they've been doing with us so far. Um, we think this is going to give our teachers the tools they need. A lot of the data we saw in the end of the year staff survey was kind of around education has changed a bit and teachers need some more supports and dealing with some of the changes. And we think by building those strong student relationships, we're going to give the staff the support they need. They're going to be more comfortable. They're going to uh, have better learning alliances with those students. And it's just going to be a more pleasant place to be. You know, and we're going to see that not only increase for our staff, but the engagement increase for our students as well. Just to give you one um, concrete example, and uh, this, uh, the ALA worked, as Mr. Pearson said, worked with our most at-risk students last year at the middle school. And one of those field trips was either on a vacation yeah. or on a Saturday. It was vacation, uh, so, yeah. Okay, so it was on a vacation. And these are students that struggled to come to school. They had 100% of them go on this field trip to Westfield State, dress up, and um, attend an assembly on what higher education is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was really impressive to see. Yeah, you come in on Tuesdays, you'll see all our students in that group Ties. dressed like me, ties, yep. shirts. They're, they're thrilled learning about yes. taking some accountability and overcoming some of the barriers. They're going on another field trip to the uh, Amdick District, uh, District Attorney's Office shortly. They've had a study hall Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're loving the results we're seeing. We want to give all our staff some of the same tools to hopefully inspire kids in the same way. And we want to continue to grow those relationships with those kids, you know, can struggle in some areas in school. And we saw great, great increases for them last year. And we want to replicate that. for the middle school. Deanna. Thank you, Rick. Oh, Ten of seven. It's laundry. I know. No, yeah, so I honestly like, look out of here, but oh, wow. <laughs> Audrey uh is up her stuff. I think um, Mr. Martin is next up with Hello, everybody. Um, so starting with uh, supporting the whole child, um, we are very happy with our attendance from last year. Um, as you can see, we reduced it from 17.9 to 10.2%. Uh, now, this is um, because our staff members, our teachers, do an incredible job at making Maple Shade a place where students want to attend, um, feel comfortable in sending their, their children to us that guarantee there. Um, 
So last year, one thing that that I had done was to utilize the um, Panorama platform to identify students who were considered uh, critical in terms of their their absenteeism. And I reached out to parents using this um, the reports generated by Panorama uh, three or four times last year. Um, so one goal that I set for myself for this year was to um, do a report monthly at the end of the month to to really look at what panorama is as is indicating as um you know who is critical in terms of uh absenteeism and then i just cross reference it with um you know what i know about uh each student's story you know and then determine whether or not um i need to reach out to the parents um and so I've done this twice so far. Um, it's been very successful. Um, at the very least, you know, parents understand that I, I care about their kids, you know, coming to school. And one thing that I, I've been trying to do this year is to um, show a correlation between absenteeism and learning loss um, in as safe a way as possible. So, um, you know, one way of doing that is being able to um, link um, the uh, ST math um, percentage to um, the, the the absenteeism. So for um, some uh, students who have been absent significantly, I'm able to show to the parents that, you know, your, your child has been absent 10 times and their ST math um, percentage right now is at 11%. The goal is 20%. So it, it really just reinforces that importance of being in school and provides a concrete example of, of um, you know, the instruction. Um, that and the learning that that's that's not occurring due to the absenteeism. So so far that's been successful, um, and I think that's just going to result with another good year of of our students uh, attending Mapleshade. Um, and speaking of Panorama, um, you know, we we really are looking at what the students are telling us directly. Um, you know, what are our students asking of us? What are our students telling us through the surveys? Um, what do they need help with? And so we are fortunate enough to have our guidance counselors be able to teach um, our students directly um, the, the um, social emotional competencies. And so we are doing two things. We are um, focusing on a trait of the month and, and really messaging this very, very clearly to the students. Um, you know, September was um, the month of empathy. Uh, uh, October was the month of friendship. Now we are in the month of gratitude. And so um, our guidance counselors are able to go into each one of the classrooms and work directly with the students on these skills and the skills identified in Panorama that the students are asking for more help with. And we are able to measure this not just on the um, you know, the social emotional surveys that students take, but our um our uh, guidance counselors, our school psychologists, our adjustment counselor are able to give pre and post assessments on these topics to see how well our students are able to self-identify um, with empathy, how much they understand what empathy means, what does it mean to be a good friend, what does it mean to be you know grateful, and then you know, the further we get along in the year, we're going to start to to build in resilience. What does it mean to persevere? Um, and once we start to get into those, we're going to be able to measure how our students are um, you know self identifying on these traits that we expect to um, uh, um, have them utilize, you know, in their academics, you know, because if our students are more emotionally resilient challenges, um, then we're going to see uh, greater success um, in their academics. So being able to link that social emotional piece with that instructional piece um, on the foundational level of three through five, we're going to be able to, to see some success. How often are those lessons? Once a week. So this is a this is a you know, fun one, um, and it's important. Uh, it's so it's a it's a concrete. You know, we're doing a lot of things with um, with this, this particular goal with uh, teaching and learning, but this is a a very clear and concrete um, action step that we are taking that is going to affect the students that that need the most support. So, you know, our students with disabilities are struggling. Um, 
And we are fortunate enough to, to, to be able to sign up for Orton Gillingham training. So um, by the end of this year, <laughs> inclusion groups um, will um, you know, have training in either Orton Gillingham or Wilson, which means that our inclusion students will have teachers who um, you know, have been trained um, with a very explicit, systematic, multi-sensory approach um, to, to give them the, the specific needs around reading that, that we're seeing. Um, and um, a, on top of our inclusion teachers, one of our learning center teachers is also being trained, as well as one of our classroom teachers in the inclusion setting. Um, so, um, you know, at, at the very least, at the very least, this is going to positively impact our um, our inclusion students, our learning center students. But also this aligns itself with the UDL approach of teaching from the margins. So, you know, everyone can benefit from supports. Everyone can benefit from scaffolding. Everyone can benefit um, from, from, from this instruction. So the more we are able to give um, to our teachers th this type of training, which is very, very involved, um, the better off our students are going to be for it. So, um, you know, we'll assess um, how well this has gone this year. You know, we'll, we'll talk to our teachers throughout the course of the year because it's very in-depth. It's very involved. It's a lot. It's a lot to take on, um, you know, eight all day sessions, multiple teachers that are, you know, being asked to, you know, to step out of their classroom and be trained. That's it's a massive investment of, of time, but I think that it's it's worth it. Um, and I don't know what the future entails for this. You know, if we are able to continue to expand, clearly, I would love to. Um, but right now we're at the beginning stages of this. I'm very, very excited. With the implementation of the state. Um, early literacy screener, will students who are identified there also have access to these types of supports, even though they're not technically inclusion? Yeah. So that goes back to, you know, my belief that, um, you know, that, that, you know, the supports will um, benefit not just the inclusion students, you know, so for instance, you know, one of our third grade teachers who's not an inclusion teacher, but she's in the inclusion setting, she's the, the homeroom teacher and then the inclusion students um, are in her class. Um, so now that she has been trained, non-inclusion students as well will be able to, to receive these, you know, these supports and this just deeper understanding of concrete reading strategies. How, how would that look with net? Because you guys are still kind of implementing the new curriculum and reading. So how does that all, does it fit together? Does, is it difficult to? So, yes, um, you know, it gives a greater understanding of the science of reading. Um, and, you know, you know, right now um, there's only been one of the eight trainings so far. Um, but the, the, one of the, the, the pieces of feedback that I received is that it aligns itself very nicely to foundations. Um, okay. And there's, there's not a lot of, there's not really any data attached to this one. Um, but it's, it's something that's important to me. Um, so I want all of our students, um, and all of our families to be able to feel as though they have place in the maple shade community. Um, so through the, the use of the, the morning announcements that gets um, shared in, in each classroom and gets shared out to, to each family, um, just traditionally, you know, we have had students report on, um, you know, such things as Hispanic Heritage Month and Black History Month and Autism Month or International Women's Month in which, you know, students will read a report on a notable figure from that particular month. Um, but I don't want that to exist in a vacuum. I don't want that to just be, you know, something separate. I want that to be housed under something more substantial, something more meaningful for, um, for Maple Shade and for this community. Um, so after last year, when I saw the amount of variety um, and backgrounds um, represented in our International Food Fest, um, I realized that we really need to be able to, to give a voice to to all members of our community. Um, so 
what I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get launched um, off of the ground and it hasn't happened yet. It's still in the, the planning stages, um, but I'm working with a fifth grade teacher and our ELL teacher. And um, we are working with um, students to be able to um, come on the morning announcements and share aspects of their cultures, their backgrounds, family traditions, um, you know, in order for our students to, to have a voice and for them to be able to um, educate their, their peers as well, so that um, we are able to see um, our students, um, you know, our, our maple shade community and what our, our, our community you know, really looks like and what it's made up of. Um, so that's something that, that we're currently working on. I just met with, um, I think it was like 14 kids. Um, I called them all down, you know, um, I, I'd worked with some teachers on, you know, who we can, um, you know, identify and, you know, who would be willing to do this, whose families are supportive. And I think there was, you know, 14 kids um, whose backgrounds are all from, you know, different, different cultures, you know, different countries. Um, and, um, you know, th they all knew what I was going to ask of them. They were all excited um, when I gave them the, the the packets of, you know, interview questions and things to think about, um, which were, you know, um, in Arabic, in Vietnamese, in uh, Japanese and Chinese, um, in Spanish. Uh, they were just they were just psyched to, to see, um, you know, their cultures, you know, represented. And so they want to talk to their families about it. And, um, you know, myself and representatives of the staff will be um, the point people for the uh, for the families to, to get this up and running. Um, I just love the idea of kids being able to interview their family members about this um, and they can either do it at home and send me the video um, or they can come in and, you know, we can work with them on it. But would you explain to everybody? you know, how your morning announcements work, because I'm not sure that they're understanding that piece. It's a, these are two days a week. Yeah. These are video announcements that go through your YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Like, and why don't you explain? Um, so we have, um, you know, so I, I, I work with, um, you know, the students and going back to the, the traits of the month um, with this month being gratitude. Um, students who are shouted out for demonstrating an aspect of the, that character trait of the month um, become, you know, students of the week. And what they're able to do is that they join me on the morning announcements um, and they're able to, you know, give news. And we talk about the, the, the big, you know, things to expect for the week. We have our regular, um, you know, routines and our bits. Um, I always forget the joke of the day. The kids always remind me of that. They get to do the joke of the day. They get to do the coffee raffle. And, um, you know, they get to talk about um, the meaning behind the character trait of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the month, what friendship means to them, what it means to be an empathetic friend, what it means to truly, you know, demonstrate gratitude. Um, you know, so it's, and it's something that, you know, gets, gets shown in the classroom in the morning on Mondays and Fridays. Um, and it gets shared out to, to families as well. So I've, you know, a number of families who, you know, always tell me that they, they watch these with, you know, their kids. And so it's, you know, everyone has a, an understanding of what's going on at, at Maple Shade, um, you know, from a, from a community standpoint, from a, you know, student standpoint. So again, to, um, to really build off of this, giving students this platform to be able to share themselves and their families. That's really important. That's it. Thanks, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Next up, we have Ms. Santanel. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. So I will be starting with attendance like uh, everyone else. Um, so correspondence with Mountain View families will continue to ensure consistent and engagement. Uh, I am happy to say that last year we exceeded our chronic absenteeism target from the state in all of our groups uh, by an average of 22%. So our all of our totals went way down. Um, this is an actually from our panorama uh, dashboard. Our year-to-date attendance right now is 96.8%, which prior to COVID was probably our average every year. Um, only after COVID, the, the few years COVID and after, did we really drop in our chronic absenteeism. At the elementary level, um, that's not 
or at least at Mountain View, it has not been an issue. Um, and we know that consistent attendance correlates with stronger academic performance. So we stress the importance of daily attendance as we strive to make Mountain View fun and engaging and wanting kids to be at school. And I will highlight some of what we do when I get to the third goal, inclusive and supportive culture and climate. So our outcome will hopefully be that we continue to exceed the state targets next year and beyond. I um, unfortunately did not include that data in this slideshow, but every category almost 20% below target. That's why I came up with the average. Yep. I believe last year, uh, I just looked. Just, just around five. It was around five. Central. Okay. Really? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was a significant drop from the COVID. Did you do anything different last year? I can't say that I did anything different. I can say that at the elementary level, at Mountain View, I'll speak only Mountain View. Um, the reason that I would see the most um, chronic absenteeism is vacations. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. If you ask me to pull that panorama target uh, Thursday, it's going to be way lower than that. I have several families on vacation because it's a short week. So, um, you know, I have it in my handbook that we discourage vacations during the school year, but um, I understand as a parent myself, it's uh, expensive to travel on the only the school vacation weeks when there is a week like this where it's short and they can go somewhere. Um, that happens. I also have a lot of families who have family in other countries and when they're traveling a long distance to visit at different times during the year, they're not going to go for a long weekend, you know. So typically that is why I have um, any kind of chronic absenteeism. Mm -hmm. I didn't bring that chart. So my second action step for supporting the whole child is we will utilize the multi-tiered system of supports, MTSS, to ensure all students progress both academically and in their social, emotional, and behavioral development by analyzing surveys from Panorama and SABERS, which stands for Social, Academic, Emotional, Behavioral Rating System, to identify student needs and act upon them accordingly. So we've been using Panorama surveys for a few years now, and they do help us identify student needs and act upon them. And we can see overall patterns, but we couldn't always tie specific data or specific responses to open-ended questions to students. So for example, if we saw a concerning open-ended response, we wouldn't know who gave us that response. So our school adjustment counselor, Nick Hutchinson, had used the Sabres in his previous district, and we decided to pilot it. So we're in our second year. It's norm referenced, and it allows us to collect data from teachers and students in a really easy way, in a quick way. Um, and we can identify at-risk students quite easily. Um, we administer it three times per year. We start in October because we want the teachers to get to know the students before they administer it. We do it again in January and May, and we do it during the second step lessons, which happen weekly, taught by Norma Campbell, the guidance counselor. She teaches fifth grade. Uh, Amy Pelzik, our school psychologist, teaches fourth grade, and Nick Hutchinson teaches the third grade. So they push into each classroom. Once per week, the classroom teachers remain in the room while they're teaching, so they understand the curriculum and what's being taught. So when they're administering savers to the students, the teachers are completing their end while in the classroom, while the lesson, while the kids are also taking it. Um, Doing this will help us see if the curriculum and our counseling or academic interventions are having a positive impact. So um, we can also use this data in parent meetings to highlight thing, how their child has responded to whether or not they're anxious or whether they feel like they're having trouble academically. So I did include a 
separate slide. I know that's probably frowned upon, but I wanted to show um, what the results look like. So the top one is a sample of results, teacher versus student. And the students' names would be on the left-hand side. I've obviously removed them. Um, but the data that needs attention is flagged with exclamation points. One exclamation point meaning there's some risk and two exclamation points meaning there's high risk. And then the MTFS team can see a comparison between what the student answered and what the teacher answered. And in this particular sample, you can see that most of the time, the teachers and students weren't that far off from each other of how they were being rated. Um, and then to further illustrate that, there's the graphs at the bottom. So the one on the left, are the, is the teacher data. So 88% of the teachers categorize their students as being low risk. And on the right are the students and 93% of the students categorize themselves as low risk. So it was pretty close in terms of how they were viewing each other. Um, but this also um, helps us see the students that if you look at the bottom student, for example, under social behavior, the teacher there's two exclamation points there. So the teacher gave uh, the student a five and the student gave themselves 15. So something's off there. So that helps us figure out what we might do to help in that situation. In Panorama, we wouldn't get that specific of data. Um, Nick wanted me to stress that we don't think savers is the be all end all yet, but so far it's been helpful. And um, the only other survey we could find out there, and I'm not going to remember the name of it right now, is in the testing stages. It's not, um, they wanted us to be part of the pilot, but we didn't really want to be the guinea pigs <laughs> in the beginning. Um, we wanted to stick with what we knew and had been using since last year. So that's why we're staying with Sabres for now. So the teachers um, literally can click through each student and rate them within a half hour. So the, the second step lessons are only a half hour and they can get their whole class done in that amount of time. So I'm not putting extra work on them to do on a prep or at home. It's happening while the students are also taking it. So hopefully we can find the students that might be at risk from uh, that data. So teaching and learning. Um, we will use the MTSS process to implement academic supports and interventions that provide students, particularly students with disabilities and English learners, equitable access to deeper learning by progress monitoring interventions and tracking data using PowerSchool, Panorama, iReady, and or other identified screening tools like the new tests that we're using in reading um, across all three grade levels to ensure our interventions are meeting student needs. And we will continue to provide evidence-based interventions to promote student success. So according to our fall administration of iReady, only 45% of Mountain View students are performing on grade level in reading and 31% in math. This is significantly lower than we've had in the past. I think this is a combination of the effects of learning loss during COVID, uh, the lack of concrete phonics instruction in the past, as well as the learning curve involved in learning uh, the two new or three new curriculums that the elementary teachers started last year with foundations, wit and wisdom, and illustrative math. So our MTSS team is made up of one teacher per grade level, two counselors, a school psychologist, an interventionist, a para, and me. And we meet monthly to analyze data so we can tailor our individual interventions and we allow the staff to implement UDL practices school-wide, participate in professional development during common planning time, professional development days, and release time. And we're hoping that with the targeted interventions, which uh, we also adjust monthly. So if we start to see students um, doing better and we feel that they're ready to come out of an intervention program, we can move new students in. Um, we're hoping that we will have 30% growth in reading and math by the spring administration of iReady. That may seem high, but it's a goal. So hopefully we will get there. 
with percentages like you just described, Elaine. Yes. Lower than what you've typically seen. Have there been um have there been impacts on core instruction? And if so, like how are teachers kind of working through putting those supports in place during the actual lessons in, in addition to the um, interventions? So um, Sarah Shabelli is my math interventionist slash coach. And sorry, I've been, I'm just coming back from being sick. I feel like I'm losing my voice now. Um, she put, has been pushing into math classes, especially helping out um, some of our newer teachers who didn't go through the initial pilot with illustrative math. Um, I often walk in with her and they're co-teaching, um, especially in our inclusion rooms where we're able to have the teacher, the coach, and the para um, instructing during the lesson, taking groups. Um, my teachers, they have embraced the curriculum um, it was a definite learning curve last year, but they're all teaching it, but they're also putting their own um, spin on things. They're in the past, if they know something has worked with manipulatives or something that might not be explicitly shown in the illustrative math curriculum, they're still doing that. They're still um, using the this, the teaching um, instruments that they've known to work in the past, even though they're using a new curriculum. Um, Having Sarah as an interventionist has been huge because we didn't have anyone to provide interventions in math before. Um, and she's using a lot of assessments, you know, even every couple of weeks to see how kids are progressing. I also use um, Amanda Emmett, my enrichment teacher, on the blocks where she's not uh, pushing in for enrichment. She also has her pull out um, GT students, but there's even a, a couple other blocks during the day where she is open. So she has been taking some other kids who Sarah may not be able to fit into her schedule. So, um, so there's been a lot going on. I also can say that our special educators, I've also noticed maybe even starting last year, have been doing a lot more inclusion and would rather be in the classroom. Uh, helping the students while they're learning from the classroom teacher. So we're trying to do a lot more of that this year. And my favorite goal. <clears throat> um, so Mountain View will continue to celebrate the diversity of the East Long Meadow School community by creating an inclusive culture where all members feel like they belong. We are going to focus on developing authentic partnerships with students and families that elevate their voices in leadership and decision-making and connecting them to the community. We um, provide our parents and community members with many opportunities to connect with the school, including not, but not limited to open house, band, chorus, and orchestra concerts, the drama club productions, our new Veterans Day Assembly, which we kind of resurrected last year, our staff versus staff kickball game, the talent show and social media, which is now Instagram. It is Mountain View School EL. We are not on Twitter slash X anymore, but um, that's going very well. Um, we have all developed a really positive, fun and inclusive culture at Mountain View that um, thrives through engaging activities throughout the school year, which I think has helped us keep our attendance where it's been for so many years because the kids want to come to school. Um, Mountain View's PTO, Principals Advisory and Spirit Squad, plan events and share photos and videos through Instagram and other communication platforms. And the staff, students, and parents are empowered to find new ways to increase the sense of community. So I've come up with some a list of some of the things that are going on this year. Some of are old, some are old, some are new. Of course, we still have our Friday dance parties, uh, which you can see on Instagram every week. I instituted a new um, fun thing for the staff last year that went over really well, and the PTO supported me. We have theme song Thursday. So right before the kids come in every week, I play 10 seconds of a TV theme song, and the teachers have to call into the office, <laughs> identify the theme song, and they win a gift card provided by the PTO. So that's been a little boost for the staff every week. Or every month, excuse me. How far back are you going? Those? Oh, I'm going back. <laughs> you go back. I went back to the 
Uh, well, one of the most popular ones was the Jeffersons, of course. Um, but yeah, I've gone back to the seventies. I mean, that's my time. I know it's not their time for a lot of them, but, um, I do put in new ones here and there. Um, we started a family holiday movie night last year. We're going to continue this year. Of course, our talent show, we switched to kickball over volleyball during COVID because we couldn't be inside and it's been very popular. So we're keeping it. Um, our spirit squad used to be called uh, the pioneers continue their community service activities and fun Fridays. They will be running our veterans day assembly this year. And um, we have a committee, a volunteer committee that has identified all of the families that have veterans and they've all been invited to attend. And we did it last year also. So um, they found it very moving and they were very grateful last year to be there. So um, it's the whole student body and staff with just the family members that are in in or were in the military in attendance. Um, we have our after school programs. Our chorus has over 65 students. Michelle Bon Giovanni is still running Fun Fitness. Um, we have a new drama club that started last year with 101 Dalmatians. We have the big reveal um, a week and a half ago. I think we are doing Willy Wonka this year. The kids auditioned last week and found out what roles they had on Friday. They were very excited. There's over 50 students involved in the drama club. Um, Eddie Polk is still helping us to run an after school program that used to be called Community Kindness. It's now called the Harmony Alliance. So there are 13 Mountain View students and 13 high school students that meet twice per month after school, kind of a mentoring um, experience. Uh, Norma Campbell and I help to identify which students we think would benefit from taking part. And we do two sessions a year. So it'll go through December, or excuse me, January, and then we'll start another session with new students in the spring. Um, our River Valley counselor, um, Danielle, has started a chess club. This really originated with a student that she sees every week who got very into chess and wanted to start a club. So she put a flyer out to the entire school. I thought she was crazy, but um, she was going to take however many signed up. She has enough chess boards and everything for everyone. So that will be starting this week. So far, she has 40 students oh signed up, all three grade levels. Um, the students who know how to play chess will be teaching the students who do not. Um, and uh, one other cute little story, I was out Thursday and Friday, and I came back to a note in an envelope addressed to me from a fourth grade student today, asking if I would please consider her letting her running a book club. Um, and that she would discuss it with me when I returned. <laughs> it was very cute. So they're being empowered. Um, and then finally, our social media intern program continues, Amy Pelzik. Uh, we have an application process. The students have to fill out a full page application. This is for fifth graders only. Um, it's a two-week position where they run our Instagram after Amy trains the first two. After that, it's a train-the-trainer model where the students have to train the next two social media interns. So that will continue. And hopefully, the end of the year, 85% of our staff, students, and parents will respond positively to all of our outreach this year. Excellent. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Elaine. Meadowbrook and Lodi and Shay will bring it bringing us home. This is the point in the night where Rich Ficero's leg has been shaken. We're <laughs> <laughs> still ahead of the previous presentation, so I think we're good. So following the same uh, pattern as everyone else, we'll start off with attendance. Um, our goal is in line with the district goal, and that is to reduce our chronic absenteeism by 3%. We've seen a significant shift in this pre-pandemic where our chronic absenteeism used to hover around 8%. Um, last year, it was up to 27.4%. And this year, oh, sorry, two years ago, it was up that high. Last year, it dropped down to 18.4%. So while we had a significant drop last year, from 27 to 18, we still have a long ways to go. Um, similar to what Elaine was saying, one of our biggest challenges is travel. It's family vacations and out-of-country travel. Um, 
understand the need, but um, I think that has an even greater impact on kids at the early elementary level because the instruction is teacher-directed instruction. Can't send the teacher on vacation with you the same way I could a textbook and we don't utilize textbooks. So it makes it very difficult for kids to catch up when they return um, because of that. So that is a challenge that we face. Um, some of the things that we're gonna try to do this year to help increase um, attendance or decrease chronic absenteeism is to um, send home a letter in the very near future, probably within the next week, highlighting key points in the revised attendance policy. Every family gets a copy of the code of conduct at the beginning of the year. Uh, they all read every page of that code of conduct as much as we would like them to. Um, so we figured we would pull out some of those key points. Our kids are the first time coming to school. So the families are not necessarily as familiar with what the attendance policy actually is and what is considered an excused and unexcused absence. So we're gonna start off just making that very clear. And then there'll be follow-up letters similar to how Connor was discussing um, with families throughout the course of this year, notifying them of what their child's attendance rate is. And we are very excited to have the district outreach coordinator position back. That was very helpful for us. And we're looking forward to partnering with her. Um, she is also a part-time preschool nurse in our building. So um, we have pretty quick and direct immediate access to her. And we plan on utilizing that position for another point of contact with families who have chronic absenteeism. The other piece of our um, supporting the whole child goal focused on training and social emotional learning program, which was a huge undertaking for us this year. Um, I don't have concrete data to support this, but I do have a lot of research um, and some observational data. We've seen a significant increase in the level of social emotional challenges and not only the frequency of them, but the severity of them. Um, something I haven't seen since my time in coming to East Long Meadow. Um, and just to make sure I wasn't completely losing my mind and sharing some observational data, I did some research on that and read a lot of articles that really support that this is a national crisis um, that we're seeing. And one that stuck out most to me was from Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. And in their article, they shared that the CDC data shows that during the last three years, Mental health emergencies rose by 24% for children aged 5 to 11 and 31% for those aged 12 to 17. That is significant, and we are living that every day. Um, and then a recent survey by the National Center for Educational Statistics found that since the start of the pandemic, 70% of U.S. schools reported a significant increase in students seeking mental health services. So the timing of adding this SEL program couldn't be better. We really appreciate being given a social emotional learning teacher, and we're glad to hire Teddy Joe Eaton, who is a very skilled special education teacher who worked in the SEBS program in Springfield for many years. So she's coming to us with a good deal of experience. Um, one of the challenges that we faced with staffing that program um, is that we weren't given any paraprofessional positions to go along with this new classroom, which services some of the kids with some of the most challenging behaviors in the entire school. Um, so we had to transfer paras from other positions within the building in order to support the program. So we're now kind of seeing the pinch of that on the other end where we're kind of short in other areas with paraprofessional support now. We have... Um, Paras in inclusion classrooms, for example, in first grade, um, we have so many students on IEPs that we have to split into three inclusion classrooms. And we only have two paras to support the students across those three rooms. So we're having to be very targeted in where we're placing them. Um, and it's become a challenge. Um, other things we're doing along with the SEL program is working on creating a program description and criteria. Uh, we are working with team, including the teacher in that program, counselors, administrators. Um, Michael sat in with us while we were working on it just to make it very clear uh, because we do also have a social skills program. So what's the difference between the two of those um, and making that delineation pretty clear. Um, social skills program historically has focused more on students with developmental disabilities such as autism um, that can function in the classroom most of the day, but just need some pull out support and some um, push in to support the generalization of skills. Whereas the SEL program is focused more on students with significant mental health challenges. So um, similar outcome, hopefully, but different profile of student 
um, and the way you approach students in each of those kind of categories is very, very, very different. Um, so uh, another piece of that that we're working on is selecting and purchasing curricular resources. And we're looking, um, we actually, we're not looking into, we just purchased the PATHS program. Um, we had the second grade resources, but we didn't have the pre-K, K and one. So working with Michael, um, we've purchased the rest of those resources and our teachers in both of the programs will be attending trainings um, on those new programs tomorrow. And we're also working on providing training and trauma sensitive practices. My initial thought with that was that I wanted to do it specifically for this program because they're working with students with a very high level of trauma. Um, but so are the rest of our teachers. So we offered that instead to the entire school. It was probably, I know I've shared this with you guys in the past, but PD days, we historically don't have the best staff attendance, including um, our teachers that are required to be there, but also paraprofessionals who have the option of attending. Um, this was probably one of the best attended professional development sessions we've had in my nine years at the school. Um, so that just tells me how timely and important that training is for staff. We did that during our last half day PD and we're doing two follow-up sessions during faculty meetings over the next couple months um, to delve deeper into some of the areas that were touched upon briefly in the beginning. Turn it over to Lauren for teaching and learning. Teaching and learning. Okay, so our vision for this goal is that the implementation of the recently, <clears throat> excuse me, adopted evidence based literacy curricula will help ensure that all students are engaged, prepared for success, and provided with relevant content that builds background knowledge and exposes students to diverse perspectives. Um, if we, I don't know if you can see very well up there, but if we look at our current beginning of the year iReady data, you'll see the overall 31% of Meadowbrook students are currently scoring at or above grade level in reading. 37% of the students are currently scoring at or above grade level in the areas of phonics. 65% um, of the students are currently scoring at or above grade level in the area of phonemic awareness. 31% are currently scoring at or above grade level in vocabulary, and 26% are currently scoring at or above grade level in comprehension. So to give you some background, last year our main focus was on implementing Hecarty Foundations and Wit and Wisdom as intended so that we had a solid understanding of the lesson structure as well as a scope and sequence. However, since there is no one-size-fits-all program that works in every classroom for every student, we now need to begin learning how to skillfully adapt the resources to better meet the needs of the students. We know that high-quality, core, comprehensive instructional materials are not a script. Instead, they provide teachers with the strong standards aligned foundation for their work. Quality materials ensure that every student is receiving access to grade level content, that units build upon concepts, and that learning is coherent and cohesive from year to year. Um, I'm sure you've heard it said that curriculum should be implemented, implemented with integrity and not fidelity. As teachers gain familiarity and comfort with the curriculum, they can then begin to skillfully adapt some of the aspects and structures while maintaining the core elements in order to better meet student needs. Um, research does show that adaptations have led to gains in student outcomes over a comparison group of teachers who continue to implement the program without a single deviation to meet individual needs. And the study referred to this as adaptation with guardrails. Um, I looked at that from Ed Reports and the article was from March, 2022. Um, so in hopes of encouraging teachers to meaningfully and appropriately adapt the curriculum, um, our action step is to um, engage in monthly literacy learning walks. The purpose of these walks will be twofold. First, we'll be ensuring that the selected curricula are being consistently taught in all classrooms. And second, by observing this work in action, we will be developing a better understanding of what next steps we need to take to deepen the work. Um, as a result of these walks, we will make note of curricular alignment and provide feedback to teachers as needed. And doing this will help us support teachers to carefully adapt these new programs, which in turn will strengthen their impact on student learning. One little piece of 
to that as I was sitting back there listening to everybody talk. And one of the things um, that, you know, cued me in was Gordon's discussion of uh, stretch growth and then Elaine's conversation about how that beginning of the year data is at kind of an all-time low point for most of us. I was looking at that data prior to this meeting and just feeling discouraged because I charted it all out. And in 2020 to 2021 school year, our fall scores were at 36%. And then the following year, 34. And then the following year, 30. So they've been trending downwards over a period of three years. This year, they went up marginally to 31%. But as I looked at this with a different lens, sitting back there listening, um, I looked at the, the spring scores and the spring scores have been trending up. So while our fall scores are trending down, our spring scores are trending, trending up. And so we are seeing a larger growth margin. So even though our scores are coming down, we're helping the kids grow further. In the spring of 2021, we had 73%. In 2022, it was 77%. And last year, it was 80%. And so we've gone from a 37 percentage point gain to a 43 percentage point gain to a 50 percentage point gain. So that was just something I really wanted to highlight. And that that large period of growth in connection with the fact that we're implementing so many new curriculum, mm -hmm. I would have expected to see our scores go down, if anything, um, because it's a huge learning process. But they, you know, and it usually takes, I'm sure we've all heard that, well, three to five years to really truly see the impact of new curriculum. Um, we're already beginning to see that growth go up a little bit. So that was kind of a a nice takeaway while I was sitting back there listening to my lane, Elaine feeling that same, like, why are they going down? And then for safe and supportive culture. Um, this is a project that I am very excited about that will not only help address the safe and supportive culture goal, but many other goals that we have. Um, back when I started at Meadowbrook nine years ago, we had two very old, very aging playgrounds. Think back to when you were a child and you were playing on those wooden structures with metal slides and tires. Um, those were what our playgrounds looked like nine years ago when I started there. And uh, they were in disrepair and just not fun anymore to be playing on. Um, so back in 2015, we wrote a community preservation grant to replace what we call the second grade playground, which is the bigger playground on the Porter Road side. Um, and we were thrilled to receive that grant and put in a brand new playground. The smaller structure, what we call our, our first grade playground, um, that remained intact until about a year and a half ago when it was in disrepair and we had to close it down and then eventually remove it. We now have reduced amount of space for children to play outside. We have up to seven classes playing outside at any one time. That is roughly about 120 to 150 kids on one playground, um, which, as you can imagine, is a very busy place with little kiddos. So that is kind of one thing in the back of my mind. Another thing that happened at this same time um, is that our preschool population has increased and we have shifted from having two classrooms to having five. In doing so, we had to relocate our entire preschool all the way across to the other side of the building in order to keep them together. And by doing that, we pulled them very far away from the playground, which is, if you've ever been to Meadowbrook and seen is in need of some help. It's a fenced in area off the corner of the building and the structures that are contained in there are more, uh, um, more appropriate for home play. They're the little types mm -hmm. of things that you would see in your own backyard, plastic mm -hmm. climbers, plastic slides. We're able to do that in the past and, and have that meet the kids' needs for a couple of reasons. One, we had a much smaller population. Two, we're able to keep it behind a locked fence. Um, those are not meant for high volume of use. Um, and so having them out without having them locked up and having kids playing on them after school um, would be a challenge or having 170 kids climbing all over them at one time. Um, so we kind of have those two issues going on. Uh, we're seeing a lot of wear and tear on our playground that's only seven years old because of the amount of kids playing on it all at one time. Um, you're starting to see where there's ropes, the metal banding showing through, starting to see some of the structures breaking and having to be closed off. So in order to address both of those things and also do something wonderful for our school and our community, I'd like to work on... Um, procuring some funding either through grants or other sources to install a new accessible playground 
on our old first grade side and make this um, the first accessible playground that East Longmeadow has had. A lot of our surrounding towns have these. Longmeadow has one, Belchertown has one, Holyoke has one, Springfield has numerous, Pittsfield has them, Westfield has them. And I think it's time that East Longmeadow have one as well. Um, I've been meeting with different companies to get quotes, show them the space, talk about what our options are, what kind of equipment would be um, helpful in installing in those areas, as well as the surfacing. That's a big piece of what keeps our playground from being inaccessible to a lot of kids. Um, it's wood chips. We discovered inadvertently in the spring of last year with trying to get some of our preschool students who were in wheelchairs and have a lot of medical equipment with them, even just from the door into the pre-K play area, they were having to go across a large stretch of lawn with no paved surface, um, which is very difficult in some of these wheelchairs. And so we worked with DPW to get a path put in um, at the end of the school year, which was challenging the timing with um, summer school and everything, but they got that done for us. Um, and so that really just brought to light how inaccessible our other playground is with all the wood chips. So I'd like to do some sort of um, rubberized kind of surface that makes the entire area accessible. I'd like to fence it in so that it meets the needs of our preschool students as well, um, but keep it open to the public um, so that it can not only be for our students during the school day, but for the public as well. So that is my very lofty goal. Renee, I happened to be over there and looked at the existing playscape. And the amount of ropes, I never realized how many ropes were in that. And I, I don't know, do the kids use that portion of the playscape to do? The amount of wear yeah. on those ropes. Um, they love climbing. Okay. They love climbing. It, my nurse. Mostly climbing. climbing. Yeah, right. I bet. They yeah. love climbing. <laughs> But um, there would be less of that on the other playground as we look to install equipment that is got a um, broader use, uh, wider stairs, ramps, yeah. wide ramps. Um, I'm even exploring like musical equipment that kids can come right up to and play out there. Lots of different options. Um, I I don't have the up to date terms on things, uh, but I think of it as a merry go round um, that you can fit a wheelchair right onto, as well as regular seats for other kids. I've looked at some of those. I've looked at um, what in my head is it teeter totter. I'm sure, they have new names now, but they have um, accessible options for those as well that we've looked into. So it'll be more things like that and smaller in size to better meet the needs of our preschool students as well. Um, because the current playground that we have is much too big mm -hmm. for the preschoolers. Would you get rid of the preschool area now that exists? Some of our teachers are actually exploring a grant opportunity to possibly put in an outdoor classroom of sorts. And that area might be able to be repurposed for something like that since it's fenced in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. I just wanted to call one thing that you mentioned in your in your data. Sorry. Um, you mentioned that last year you had an extensive focus on Hegarty and its implementation. Three programs: Hegarty Foundations and Wit and Wisdom. Which um, Hegarty and Foundations in particular that really targets like phonemic awareness. And when you take a look at this year's entry point data to the fall. You're sitting at 65% of students scoring at or above grade level. I'm thinking about that progression from phonemic awareness to phonics, to vocabulary to comprehension. Starting off the year with that 65% will inevitably like have that trickle down effect on the other areas of reading. So just again to call out like you had a focus last year. It was a strategic one. And then this year you see students coming in, sitting at a higher spot historically we would have seen it's actually been pretty consistent that's great I was shocked to see that so when I looked back at the spring or the fall 2021 phonemic awareness was 69 percent in fall of 22 it was 64 and in fall of 2020 I'm off a year 2020 was 69 2021 was 64 and 2022 was 67 last year it actually dropped by two percentage points um but Again, our end of the year data has gone up mm. where we went in 2020, 2021 was 85, 89, 90. So, and that's like the foundation for the rest of the reading. But like, so that's terrific to see. Thank you. Thanks so much.
Thank you. No, thank you, team. Yeah, thank you, everybody. For thank you. Appreciate it. We're all big vote, all the town residents. Oh, yeah. all right. Elaine, there's a vote tomorrow. Good <laughs> morning. You know, to you, something that have, affects you. <laughs> okay, we're going to get out of here by eight. Oh, no, I do Sarah doesn't think so. Um, just quickly, because it links. It's my um, my fault that I didn't make it a, its own agenda item, unless you wanted to make it, have an amendment and put my educator plan okay. down under Bye. business. That's up to you. I can go quickly through it. Hi. Hi. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Well, I, I don't want to add it to the agenda if it's not on the agenda. Well, it's linked to the goals that we just set because okay. most of it's interconnected with the goals okay. that we just set. As yeah, answers. we'll just keep going okay. with it. But it's actually part of it. Yeah, I'm cool with that presentation. <laughs> or I can bring it back. Go ahead. Okay. Um, more or less uh, everything that you just heard from our leadership team, I've incorporated into my own educator plan. Um, and what I've done is then highlighted, uh, the different, um, measurements, um, such as we talked about, if we're able to pull this off and support all the different things that our schools are doing, we hope to see 5% of our students making that typical growth or uh, annual growth on the first page. Um, we also want to see 30% of our students making that stretch growth on iReady. That's the... Those are some of the big what I've done too, and I'll let you certainly read through it, and then we can bring it back if you like uh, next meeting. Just intersperse as I did last year the focus indicators that make sense connected to the different areas. Um, I'm not. I won't read the whole thing to you, but um, obviously our focus, as you heard today. It's very much so on attendance, making sure students are here. But then also, and you heard it in the presentations um, separately, last year we did it uh, more as a, a joint. Um, Ms. Brown and I are separating, and we're trying to each do um, two to three learning walks in each of the buildings with principals so that we're connecting to some of the things that are going on in their goals, make sure that not only are we seeing it, but where and how can the district support. Uh, and if they're seeing much more of a coordinated um, front of support, I think we're gonna continue to see some of the growth that you talked about, uh, especially at Meadowbrook. It was nice to hear um, in terms of where their percentages ended up at the end of the year. In terms of going to um, the final overarching goal, third overarching goal on um, supporting the um, inclusive and diverse environment, um, a couple things. Last year at the end of the year, we reactivated our diversity and equity steering committee. We had two meetings at the end of the year. They were um, incredibly helpful in contributing to how we started to develop the goals that you just heard for um, the district and the schools. We want to bring them back and help us very specifically start to look at um, how do we embrace the community and engage the community more around the work that we're doing and is part of Desi's vision. I, I think that's, um, there's unfortunately, in many municipalities, uh, there's a disconnect as to sort of what is DESE's vision, what are the standards, what are schools doing, and what actually is understood in the community. And so hopefully that steering committee can help us engage the community in very positive um, ways so that we're moving forward as a whole community. Um, one of the supports for me um, and increasing my uh, leadership skills is I'm going to continue to work with the Mass Association of School Superintendents. I'm working with their ready planning group um, because at the first meeting in September, I was vocal. Um, I got drafted to facilitate their November 29th meeting for um, superintendents and districts across uh, the Commonwealth. That's actually going to take a very specific look. And Mr. McGee was the one who um, 
gave me this idea. Um, how does the partnership between the superintendent, the high school principal, and the athletic director really become a lever for an entire district to move forward in their um, equity work? Because uh, if you think about the amount of community engagement and emotion um, and school spirit and school climate that are wrapped up in athletics, um, it's considerable. So if we can um, start to utilize that partnership, and we're very um, lucky here, uh, incredible staff that we have, that we have a pretty strong partnership now. If we can build on that, we can utilize uh, Mr. McGee's Athletic Leadership Council. I think we can really have some nice impact in terms of not only moving the culture of the high school, but the district. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things the students are already talking about is what goes on in our stands any given game night. Um, and they're not the ones <laughs> generally the ones on the field listening to some of the things that are going on in the stands. Um, and so that's just some of the things that we're talking about. We don't have any substantive programs to put in place yet other than the uh, Wednesday webinar, which I'll be doing around that partnership and starting to speak to what can districts do? Um, and we'll have a panel of experts, all of whom went through the training last year that involved uh, superintendent, principal, and athletic director to go to a two-day training on um, how you deal with climate and um, even more specifically, erasing hate from uh, school athletics. Those are some quick points. How do you do, Anselma? <laughs> okay, we can go to the next thing. <laughs> That's. I figured you might be going there, so I, we'll I wanted to go back, quickly. We'll come back to this, though. Yeah. Okay. I'll bring that back to. Yeah. Are we again. going to go over it again? Yes. Or, okay. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Sure. Thank you for going over. Absolutely. It was my fault uh, not to get it on the agenda and it's as its own agenda item, but since we always do it uh, as part of the presentation, I, think I should say something. Change to the code of conduct. Okay, so in your packets, you have um, a two page item that um, is from our code of conduct, the 2023-2024 code of conduct. Ironically, as we were revising it last year, we were going through um, tiered focus monitoring by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, they guide us, guided us in a number of revisions that we put in place last year. And then we went through um, our own revisions. Specifically, we were looking at, if you remember, last year there was state law that was changed regarding suspensions. Um, and looking at specifically um, schools attempting to find alternative means of dealing with student behavior without suspending or separating students from the school and educational programming. So one of the things that we in Songmeadow had come up with was the temporary alternative schedule because often the um, situation may be a very small portion of a student's day. It could be one class. It could be even um, one passing time or one element of the day. And if we're working with that child and we provide over the course of one, two, maybe three days, nothing too um, significant in terms of length, a temporary alternative schedule, we're providing all the same educational programming and opportunities with the exception of that one change. So that was something we had put in place. We had taken out in-school suspension. In-school suspension is the total separation of um, a student from their scheduled educational programming with the exception of having the, the child in school, hence the name in school suspension. So those, that's the big difference. In our fall um, review, Desi wanted us to put it back in. 
They said um, after some discussion that we could keep temporary alternative schedule because the discussion was not only um, robust with Mr. Fredette and me, but also I provided them all of the um, discussion that we had had with our um, council around, can we do this with the new law in terms of the temporary alternative schedule? And we shared that with our tiered focus monitoring team from DESE. Um, they took it under advisement. And ultimately what they're asking us to do is add back, keep temporary alternative schedule, but add back in school suspension. So that's what we're adding back. Um, and what uh, if all of you um, approve this, then I will send out a notice to all families and um, we will put the revised edition up on the school website. In school suspension, or does that just mean they're in school and they're in a room all day mm -hmm. and it lasts all day? Mm -hmm. And temporary alternative schedule is... It could simply be if you had an incident um, in Mr. Class. Smith's class and while we're working with you to support you uh, around that situation, we're not going to have your report to Mr. Smith's class. Mm -hmm. um, that could be for a day. That could be for two days. Generally, I don't think we've had anything longer than two or three days. So um, and all of that's communicated to the parent and the student. So where would they go for that? Generally, they're working with either a counselor, an administrator, maybe both during that time. Oh, so they're not in the in-school suspension room? No. Whatever that is. And technically, we don't have an in-school suspension room. Oh, I mean, <laughs> so they have in-school suspension. It's, where are they going? It's challenging. Oh. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons that we also took it out. Oh, okay. Um in school suspension is not a an incredibly well defined program in either our high school or middle school. We've used it, mm -hmm. but we don't have a dedicated room or dedicated staff to an in school suspension program. Mm -hmm. So if we do in school suspension, which certainly parents like better than out of school suspension, right. you're dedicating staff um, that you know maybe are used to on a daily basis doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're coming up with a very creative schedule to make that happen. But it's a full separation from a student's educational, daily educational program, mm -hmm. where the temporary alternative schedule is not. That's that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, take a motion to add them back in, please. I move to improve, uh, improve, move to approve the in-school suspension uh, vision to the code of conduct as presented. Great, excellent. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> excellent. Second. Looking for a second. There it is, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. opposed say nay. Motion carries five to zero. We're going to this thing anyway. You are. Right. Did you read these? Uh -huh. Have you read mm -hmm. these? I actually have. Do you want to? Uh, no, I don't want to because I have no idea the process of what I'm supposed to. Typically, we will, it's just the resolution. Um, we'll move it in an, an affirmative and then we can vote on it. We sh we'll probably just go for, you know, one at a time. Really, what we typically do is just read the, um, the therefore. So number one would be the resolution one, full stable funding for METCO. Uh, therefore, be resolved that the Massachusetts Associated School Committees calls upon the governor and the legislative legislature to create a stable funding structure to support METCO and its partner districts that fully funds the support provided by METCO and the cost of providing services delivered by METCO's partner districts. One of the key um, items, I think, behind this is that it's uh, subject to appropriation. And so what they're looking to do is have it be, just as you read, stable funding that, um, and probably increased funding to cover all the districts that participate in the METCO program. So the motion would be to um, support Resolution 1 <coughs> as presented. Would take that motion. Do you have me? 
Sure. I move to approve resolution one as presented full stable funding for MECO. But we're going to support it. Oh, yep. Support it. Thank you. Make sure maybe Kate. So what's going to happen is support. she's going to go on the floor and support it or not. Okay. 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 Because we don't get to approve it. So mm -hmm. they'll approve it. Okay. Let me do it again. Conference. Nope. <laughs> Thank you. Again. Motion made by Kate. Amy second. Amy. Amy. Second. Thank you, Amy. Seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. That one carries five to zero. Resolution two regarding investigations and recommendations for transportation bidding procedures. Therefore, be resolved that the Mass Association of School Committees prevail upon the Office of the State Auditor to investigate the bidding practices of school transportation providers and to present such findings and recommendations as may be necessary to contain costs and make more efficient transportation services available for public schools. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, a motion to uh, support resolution two. Like a motion resolution number two. Motion made by Antonella. Second. Second by Sarah for the question. Favor say aye. 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 MASD encourages the legislature with the aforementioned proposed language or alternative and move the period to provide regional district the ability of so desired to charge a transportation fee that an aggregate cannot exceed the differential between the missing word and the Commonwealth reimbursement and the regional school district transportation expense for any pupil that resides greater than one and one half months school of attendance measured by a commonly traveled route. Pupils may opt out of transportation and not be subject to transportation fees. Basically, I think um, they're trying to level the playing field yeah. between regional. In charge. Yeah, yeah. We, non-regional non districts can, district. can charge. Yeah. Regional districts cannot charge. Uh -huh. uh, motion to support resolution three. I make a motion to support resolution three. Motion made by Anthony Noah. Second. Second by Kate. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Aye. Sorry. Resolution five, that carries five to zero. Four. Uh, four. Four. Diversity, equity, inclusion. But that carries five to zero. Yeah. Yep. Resolution four. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, MASC recommends that all districts adopt the positions of DEI coordinator to work towards an anti racist school system. I'm not in favor of this. What's the DEI coordinator? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, funding. basically, yeah, it's uh, yeah. what they're saying above is that, um, you know, given that you have DESI's vision, you have MASC, MASS uh, supporting that, that their, whichever group um, submitted this, um, asking MASC as a whole to pass a resolution that why everybody would have to decide that everybody else has to hire someone well, else. I mean, that's why you, it comes to yeah. each. I don't like mandating committee. other um, districts to to hi make uh, to hire employees. What I would say is uh, the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative did hire uh, a DEIB um, coordinator with whom we work very closely, uh, and she's um, was in her first year or first three quarters of a year last year and is working with all seven districts. So at least we have um, some support and guidance there through the collaborative, um, but certainly it's the school committee's um, prerogative as to. Uh, I'll a motion to support resolution five. I make a motion to support resolution four. Four, thank you. I'm trying to rush it. See that? That's the thing you're here. You and Gordon. <laughs> Motion has been made by Antonella. I second. Second by Amy. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed nay. 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 Motion fails uh, one to four. Resolution five, <laughs> building authority. Uh, ba, 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 Massachusetts MASC calls upon the MAA, Massachusetts legislature to amend Mass General Law 70B Section 7 by removing the $800 million cap 
And uh, MASC calls upon Massachusetts School Building Authority to reinstate the accelerated repair program for 2024 applications. And that MASC calls upon uh, Massachusetts legislature to allow public preschools to be included in the accelerated repair programming for programs. Yeah. Motion to support resolution five. I make a motion to support resolution five. Motion made by Antonella. Second. Second by Sarah. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. That carries five to zero. Resolution six. School bus stop arms surveillance acts and enforcement and penalties. The significant system parents presenting the out of the stop school bus barking or disembarking passengers are endangering our students and mass students. Presently, unless wounded by a police officer, the penalties for passing a school bus are minimal. If the registration plate of the offending vehicle is reported by the bus driver, there is a minimal fine. I don't know what the fine is. No, right now there's a minimal fine. Right now, yeah. Yeah. Move to support resolution six. Motion made by Amy. Second. Second by Amy discussion. They want to put a live video detection monitoring system on it. And then they can go after the car. You're reading that. that sure. it's, uh, therefore Here. resolved. Yeah. So they're bottom. just raising the fine. It's on the bottom of the first Or page. recorded by a digital video detection monitor. Okay. So we're not required to have them. There has to be a bus say stop it's all in all. Or. Oh. Another hmm. unfunded mandate. So we would have to install cameras on all the buses. Live the digital arms. video. Yeah. On the outside of the buses. We have them on the inside already. Right. Yeah. We wouldn't have to do it. <laughs> collaborative effort. The cost would be passed on. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So Therefore, on to our fair families. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a motion this for resolution six. You have one. I think I said it. And Amy seconded. I just asked a question. I saw the there. I am sorry. I don't think we should. I don't know. I don't like it when people pass the school buses. No, they definitely should not be passing the school buses. Right. Um, motion remains seconded. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. 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 Mm. Not passed one to four. Resolution seven related to MCAS. MCAS urges messages to develop a wider, more conscious built consensus, consensus built strategy or an evaluation system with meaningful input from legitimate stakeholders. Not the uh, illegitimate ones. Am I getting poking now? You're getting a little Yeah, yeah. sorry. Bullet two, the MASC. And she urges the state legislature to launch a comprehensive evaluation to investigate the extent of biases pertaining to MAS, MC, MCAS. MCAS. MCAS testing and make the results public. The MCAS urges Massachusetts to enact. And the MASC, see, that's why they're so. That's tough. tough. MASC yeah. urges yeah. Massachusetts to enact the moratorium on MCAS testing effective immediately. MASC urges Massachusetts to develop an alter alternative to the high stakes MCAS test. This is big. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot in this one. There is. There's a lot. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. How do we feel about that one? <clears throat> huh? I love this love one. It? Okay. <laughs> of course I do. Okay. I especially love the uh, the last one, developing an alternative. Mm. That one does it for me there. Cool. I didn't understand a motion to support resolution seven. Motion made to support resolution seven. Motion made by Amy. Second. Second by Kate. Discussion. All in favor. Of I feel like they would have to show us the alternative, or I would want to vote. Well, but then we're asking them to develop one. That's with the develop it to show it to us. Likely it would be portfolio based. No. Ooh. I don't know. I know. Yeah. It sounds that scares like me. a lot of work. Yeah. 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 Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Nay. Motion carries three to two. Sarah's going to do re resolution number eight. Um, <laughs> storage of firearms. Yeah. 
page. Therefore, be it resolved, the MASC recommends all districts to urge the superintendent and staff to create an appropriate communication to parents and guardians that explains the importance of secure firearm storage, protect children and teens from unauthorized access to unsecured firearms, and their legal obligations consistent with Massachusetts safe storage law. It further resolved that MASC urges other communities to work with their local law enforcement agencies, health agencies, and nonprofit organizations to collaborate and increase efforts to inform district parents and guardians of their obligations regarding secure storage of firearms in their homes and vehicles. Sure. In motion to support resolution eight. I move, I move to support resolution eight. Motion made by Keith. Second by Amy, discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Nay. Motion carries three to two. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'll tell you. Thank you. Robotics. Um, and finally, we have a request for out of state. I believe it's just a robotics. It says the. Um, the drone is coming later. Yes. So if you just put the robotic field trip um, on these three dates? Yes, those are the three dates they have right oh, yeah. now. Okay. Um, and they are looking at um, some drone competitions, which will come later. Any other questions? Um, mm -hmm. If not, I entertain a motion for the robotics field trip on the three dates. I move to approve the robotics field trip on three dates. As presented. Motion made by Antonel. Second. Second by Kate Scutton. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. And carry five to zero. We good? Yes. Tomorrow to vote. Day to day. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well. I didn't say in a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Mackey. Welcome. Motion made by Sarah. Second. Second by no. Discussion all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you.